All right, uh, we are in 2 Samuel. I believe Mark tells me you got about halfway through chapter 13 on Sunday. So that's where we'll be picking up, 2 Samuel chapter 13. Okay. And uh, in the basic flow of the story, what we're really looking at, the whole arc of chapters 13 through 20 is kind of the aftermath of David's sin. And we really need to view chapters 13 through 20 as a single uh, story that shows problems that went on during David's reign. And of course, it's all ultimately tied to the prophecy that Nathan makes in chapter 12, uh, whenever it says that I will raise up evil against you from your own household. In 2 Samuel chapter 12 and verse 11. Well, what winds up happening in 2 Samuel 13 is David's oldest son, Amnon, uh, has a, uh, a bit unnatural crush on his half-sister Tamar, and he decides uh, to take her for himself. He winds up raping her in a very, what is probably one of the darkest uh, scenes in the book. And then, after he's done with her, he decides he doesn't love her anymore. Now he hates her. Uh, lust seldom... Uh, Lust is seldom satisfied with what it gets. And now he wants to send her away. In verse 15, it says, Amnon hated her with a very great hatred. But the hatred with which he hated her was greater than the love with which he had loved her. And Amnon said to her, Get up! Go away! But she said to him, No, because this wrong in sending me away is greater than the other that you have done to me. And he would not listen to her. He called his young men who attended him and said, Now throw this woman out of my presence and lock the door behind her. And she had on a long-sleeved garment, for in this manner the virgin daughters of the king dressed themselves in robes. Then his attendant took her out and locked the door behind her. Tamar put ashes on her head and tore her long-sleeved garment which was on her. And she put her hand on her head and she went away, crying aloud as she went. The narrator really doesn't want us to like Amnon very much. Uh, he's you know, depicting Amnon as just this, well, basically a really bad person, a jerk, if you want to... Uh, uh, we, you know, we're not just spectators here to a historical curiosity. What we're seeing here is, you know, we're supposed to sympathize with Tamar as the hapless victim and sort of to look down on and judge Amnon for his, how, what the evil pervert that he is. Uh, and, you know, uh, what, what's going on here? Uh, we don't know exactly why Tamar would have thought that it would be a worse idea to send her away. Uh, that's a little bit of a shocking statement in and of itself, too. Um, there were some strange ideas in the ancient Near East about how rape functioned. Uh, in middle Assyria, there was a law on the book for vicarious rape. If a woman was raped, then the, uh, the law specified as punishment that the rapist wife would also be raped. Well, there's, you don't find anything like that in the Bible. But you find that in middle Assyria roughly the same time that all this is going on. Uh, but Amnon discards her. He treats her like a piece of trash. He's used her. He's had his way with her. He's getting rid of her. He no longer calls her his sister, but uh, verse 17, this. And I realized that, I think this came up last time. Uh, the word woman is not in the Hebrew text. It's a feminine form of the verb, of the noun, this. Just get this out of here. Now, before that point, it's my sister this, my sister that. Come lie with me, my sister. Now, get this out of here. He's, he's definitely dehumanizing her, is the idea here. Um, and Tamar is mourning. You look at the gestures that she does here. She wears a long-sleeved garment. Actually, that's the same word used for Joseph's coat of many colors in Genesis 37. Uh, it's a Joseph's coat of many colors was probably really just a long-sleeved garment that Jacob gave to him as a way of saying that, you know, oh, you're not going to have to do manual labor which would have really infuriated his brothers against him. Um, and although it definitely doesn't, it, do, it doesn't preach as well or look as well on children's Bible storybooks as the coat of many colors does, so that's why we've uh, got that. Um, the garment was a symbol of royalty. Now that, she, now that it's lost, uh, it was a symbol of royal virginity. And now that she's lost her virginity, she tears it, she mourns. She has no way of knowing if there's going to be a pregnancy. She has no way of hiding her loss of virginity. Uh, it would have made her substantially unmarketable in that culture uh, because of the kind of emphasis they placed on that. But Absalom finds her and he comforts her in verse 20 and says, Has Amnon your brother been with you? But now keep silent, my sister. 
He is your brother. Do not take this matter to heart. So Tamar remained and was desolate in her brother Absalom's house. Now, what, what do we think of Absalom's reaction here? Do not take this matter to heart. Well, I'm not sure. I mean, I don't think sure exactly how to take this thing. Like when Jesus called his mother, he thinks that's kind of cold. That was a term of endearment. Hey, so like calling her mommy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, it does come across that way. Okay, well, no, it does come across that way a little bit. Um, granted, I mean, Absalom, you know, don't don't worry about this. Uh, Amno, Absalom uh, probably has something else in mind, of course. You know, we, we see that he's a, a long-term planner throughout the book. He serves revenge as a de as best served cold. And, you know, don't set this matter on your heart. Keep silent. Keep quiet. You know, he kind of... And I mean, the one suggestion that's out there is he just simply has her, you know, keep quiet about this. Don't keep bringing this up. I want everybody to forget about it long enough so nobody suspects what I'm going to do next. What is Absalom going to do next? Well, he's setting up Amnon to kill him. Um, now, and Absalom takes her into his house, and she lives as a desolate woman in the house of her own brother. So she's cared for. Now, David has a little bit of a different reaction. In verse 21, King David heard of all these matters. He was very angry. But Absalom did not speak to Amnon either good or bad, for Absalom hated Amnon because he had violated his sister Tamar. Uh, what do we think of David's response? He's really angry. Sorry. And then what? You know, and the and then what is probably what we're supposed to see. And actually, there's a, there's a textual variant in uh, the Septuagint and in the Dead Sea Scrolls that adds this line. When King David heard all these things, he was very angry, but he did not rebuke the spirit of his son Amnon because he loved him because he was his firstborn. Uh, that's in some of the older manuscripts. So, so he what, turned a blind eye. Hmm? He turns a blind eye to it. You know, he doesn't really deal with the problem. Now, some people speculate that because David failed to act here, Absalom, this not only becomes the basis of Absalom killing Amnon, but also the entire basis of Absalom's coup. I, I don't know about that, um, but I'll just throw that out there. But because David fails to act, what happens? Well, Amnon remains an unpunished felon. Tamar languishes as damaged goods, and Absalom becomes a seething vigilante. That's what's going on here. Um, now, David, of course, you would think that David might feel a little measure of guilt since, well, he's the one that originally sent Tamar on that ill-fated errand for her brother. But that's not what happens. Absalom, Absalom gives his brother the silent treatment. Doesn't speak a word to him either good or bad. Oh, now that's actually the same expression used in Genesis 37 uh, when Joseph's brothers don't speak a word to him either good or bad. It's an idiomatic way of saying, you know, I'm not talking to you anymore. I don't like you anymore. You know, and of course, two years go by. That brings us to the next phase, verse 23. It came about after two years, two full years, that Absalom had sheep shearers in Baal Hazor, which is near Ephraim. And Absalom invited all the king's sons. Absalom came to the king and said, Behold, now your servant has sheep shearers. Please let the king and his servants go with your servant. But the king said to Absalom, No, my son, we should not all go, for we will be burdensome to you. Although he urged him, he would not go, but blessed him. And then Absalom said, If not, please let my brother Amnon go with us. And the king said to him, well, Why should he go with you? But when Absalom urged him, he let Amnon and all the king's sons go with him. Absalom commanded his servant, saying, See now, when Amnon's heart is merry with wine, and when I say to you, Strike Amnon, then put him to death. Do not fear. Have not I myself commanded you? Be courageous and be valiant. The servants of Absalom did to Amnon, just as Absalom had commanded. All the king's sons arose, and each mounted his mule and fled. Alright. Why does Absalom have Amnon killed? Hmm? Well, Payback. Okay. All right. And that's certainly a definite part of it. That's what's stated in the text. You think? Stated in the text, but also something that hasn't 
say this in the text. Mm-hmm. Amnon was the first son, therefore he was the king. Right. With him out of the way, it put Absalom closer. That's true. It does. Uh, Whatever that's worth, I, mean, I don't know. I mean, you know, we know from verse 32 that Absalom is motivated to avenge Tamar. But the fact that Amnon would have been the likely heir to the throne, well, that can't hurt the deal any, as far as he's concerned. Uh, It would have been easily a self-serving secondary motive. With Amnon out of the way, Absalom is the next logical choice as king. Um, Now, Absalom's not the chosen one. Uh, Absalom is the one who exalts himself. And in killing his brother, he puts himself in the same boat as, uh, well, guys like Cain and Abimelech and Jehoram, men who kill their brothers. Uh, Perhaps Amnon is not a very good brother, but still, uh, what we see, Absalom is not going to prove himself to be that great of a character either. Now, when uh, Absalom has this other thing going on, he he tries to get David to come to his sheep shearing feast. What do we make of that? When David, you know, why invite David first? Was Absalom expecting him to refuse? Uh, some I, I read one guy who suggested that Absalom was actually planning to kill David at this thing too, but we have no way of knowing that. Um, in any case, what Absalom's conspiracy is, we kill Amnon at the appointed time. Uh, he tells his men, well, be courageous and valiant, which is kind of interesting words for a murder conspiracy. And Absalom, well, Absalom's learned something from his father's behavior about how to get people drunk. And... You know, here he exacts justice. Amnon should have died according to the law, but since he didn't, Absalom becomes kind of a vigilante here and engages in his own brand of justice. Just as Amnon raped Tamar during a meal that was not what it seemed to be, Absalom kills Amnon during a meal that is not what it seems to be. Uh, You know, we need to appreciate something else. The way David's sins come back to haunt him in this chapter... Uh, how, how do David's sins come back to haunt him in chapter 13? Okay. Right. Okay, the unrest in the family, certainly. Was... Partial manner. What David did with Bathsheba was that the Tamar was a little bit more in the Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. I mean, David's sexual sin with Bathsheba is mirrored by the sexual sin taking place in his own household with Tamar, right? No. Something else, too, though. What else is echoed? I. Hmm? All right. Somebody dies. David's murder by conspiracy. Kind of echoed by Absalom's murder by conspiracy. You know, Absalom, David getting Uriah drunk kind of echoes Absalom getting Uriah drunk. And, you know, why is all this happening in David's house, though? It's already been said. Who's causing all this, ultimately? David causes it by his sin. You know, but who's swinging the hammer of justice here? Well, God is. Yeah, this is... This is an interesting thing, because God, Yahweh is never mentioned by name in this chapter, and yet we're clearly seeing His words fulfilled. In chapter 12, and verses 11 and 12, I will raise up evil against you from your own household. You did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel, God says. Here we're seeing the very dark side of providence. Uh, the Lord's word comes to pass. God keeps His promises, and sometimes they're not pretty. Doesn't mean God is doing evil. God is simply using evil to accomplish his will. No. I mean, there was one prophet that complained to God, how can you bring this evil to evil in Israel and punish 
Mm-hmm. But don't worry about them. I'll take care of them. Right. But Israel needs to They're the ones who do it. That's Why an... not use evil? Go ahead and do things like that and take care of them instead of making righteous people do bad things. I'm glad you brought that up. You know, because that's basically what's going on with Absalom in David's house, isn't it? God uses Absalom to punish David. But does Absalom get off scot-free? No, Absalom himself gets punished later in the story. You know, the Lord, and it specifically says in chapter 16 that the Lord uh, it was orchestrating Absalom's death. Sorry, not chapter 16, chapter 17. It says the Lord th- ordained to thwart the good counsel of Ahithophel so that the Lord might bring calamity, or literally the Lord might bring evil on Absalom. So uh, there's kind of a double-edged sword here. He brings justice for David using an evil man, and then he avenges David by bringing uh, a, another retributive strike on Absalom. Uh, this is how the justice of God kind of works in these cyclical patterns throughout Scripture. You see it in Habakkuk with Jerusalem and the Babylonians. You see it in Isaiah with Assyria and Samaria. And, you know, whenever the Lord finishes using Assyria, the rod of his anger, he then turns around and brings judgment on them. Because they had the audacity to exalt themselves. They were not properly motivated while carrying out the justice of God. And so what's interesting here is that even though David is the one primarily being punished here, we're going to see during Absalom's revolt, David is the one who conducts himself still with acceptance and with good character with upstanding integrity. Even while he's being punished, David proves himself to be a man after God's own heart. We're going to see that as we get into chapters 15 and 16 and so on. Um, you know, we need to appreciate how David's sins are coming back to haunt him here. Well, now we get to verses uh, 30 through 33. Can I get a volunteer to read 30 through 33 of chapter 13? And I was while they were on the way of the Lord came to David saying, Absalom has struck down all the king's sons, and not one of them is left. The king arose and tore his clothes and lay on the ground, and all his servants were killed by his five with his clothes on. Jonadab, the son of Shimei, and David's brother, responded, Do not let my lord suppose they would have all the young men. I am not alone in the because by the intent of Absalom, this has been determined since the day he violated the now therefore, do not let my lord the king take the report to heart, namely, all the king's sons of death, for only the Amnon. I'm sorry, verse 36. I'm. No, that was my fault. The fled, and the young man who was the watchman raised his eyes and looked, and behold, many people were coming to the road of the So did that have said to the king, Behold, the king's sons of God were in your first word, so it happened. He had finished all the king's also the king, all his servants wept. Okay. Alright, now, you notice uh, one character comes back that we saw at the beginning of the chapter, Jonadab. Why does Jonadab appear here in this scene? <laughs> well, I mean, why, why you know, you notice how Jonah, why does Jonadab show up here? All places. Why, why, of all people, why this guy? I think Jonadab was the wise man. Favor. Or orchestrated sin against Tamar. Her. But he kind of stayed out of that and seemed to have gotten off pretty well scot free. And now, the proof, you know, the chickens have come home to roost, so to speak. So Jonadab is up here as kind of the hero of bringing the good news. Wait a minute, all your sons aren't dead just one. <laughs> just, yeah. just the perpetrator. Right. Now, Jonadab is kind of in the know about everything, you know. He's the guy who started all the mess in the beginning of chapter 13, and now he's the guy who kind of finishes it and wraps it up the end of chapter 13. Some people speculate that Jonadab was always in cahoots with Absalom and was always against Amnon. And uh, I mean, I don't know how much you can read into that. Well, I wonder kind of how much in Absalom had spoken. 
<laughs> he, seem, he seems to know something about Absalom's intentions <laughs> in verse 32. Uh, you're right, though. Jonadab is wise without principle. Uh, you know, David, of course, gets a distorted report at first. Absalom's killed all the king's sons. He was probably watching televised news and got the exaggerated version up front. And, uh, I mean, it's, it's the truth. I'll just say it. Uh, David tears his clothes and he weeps. You know, it's kind of interesting. In chapter 12, David tore his clothes and he wept and he fasted when his child was sick. And then he immediately arose and ate and drank and accepted the fact that his child had died. Well, here, it's the opposite he gets news that all of his sons are dead, and he tears his clothes and weeps. And this is actually very reminiscent of the scene from Job chapter 1, you know, where the messenger shows up, all your sons are dead! Even kind of a similar setting. We got them all gathered in one house. But it's not the book of Job, and that's not what happened. Jonadab uh, comes to David, and he tells him, no, you've got it wrong, only one person's dead. And verse 33, we see a phrase we've seen before, do not let the king take the report to heart. We saw that earlier, didn't we? Where did we see that? That's what Absalom said to Tamar. And that's what Jonadab is saying to David. Oh, don't take this to heart. You know, don't take this to heart. It could be a lot worse than it is, David. You know, so there is a, uh, again, it comes off a little callous, um, comparatively speaking. The rest of the sons, of course, return in verses 34 and 35. And... Uh, you know, the, the watchman sees them coming. Everything turns out to be okay. Jonadab's words, of course, are not really comforting, though. Because in verse 36, it says that the sons came, lifted their voices, and wept. And the king and all his servants wept bitterly. Everybody who comes into the city is weeping. David continues weeping. Verse 37, David mourned for his son every day. Well, there's a little bit of a grammatical ambiguity here. Which son is he mourning for? Alright, now that... We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. Um, now Absalom's fled to Gesher. Why flee to Gesher? I'm sorry, we didn't read verses 37 and 38. Absalom fled, went to Talmai, the son of Amihud, the king of Gesher, and David mourned for his son every day. So Absalom had fled and gone to Gesher and was there three years. Uh, and then verse 39, the translation is a little difficult. I would translate it as, King David ceased to go out against Absalom, for he was comforted concerning Amnon since he was dead. Uh, Alright, so why would Absalom flee to Gesher? Not a city of refuge. Here's another question we should be asking ourselves. Is it even an Israelite city? Yeah, well, it's not a Philistine city. It's actually a Canaanite city. Uh, the Geshurites are, among other things, in that list of nations that are supposed to be uh, destroyed. And I believe it's, they appear in Genesis 15 when the Lord makes His promise to Abraham. Uh, or maybe not. I made, 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 made a mistake there. Um, but David, well, the Geshurites have come up in Samuel before. Anybody know what David's relationship was with Geshur elsewhere? Anybody look at 1 Samuel 27? What was going on there? First Samuel twenty seven. Okay, all right, yeah. Verse eight, he was waging war against the Amalekites, the Gerzites, and the Geshurites. David uh, So David's had kind of a rocky relationship with the Geshurites already. They're already Canaanites. Um, and but, we know something else about the Geshurites, too. Why is Abs what, is the, what is the appeal of Geshur for Absalom? Yeah. My grandfather on mommy's side lives in Geshur. At some point, David formed a marriage alliance 
with this group by marrying the daughter of the king of Geshur. Um, now, David, Absalom spends three years in Geshur. How do you think that's going to play into the story? Is that going to play into the story? What would David be doing for three years with a pagan king who already has an uneasy relationship with David? Hmm? Oh, no, no, no. Well, Absalom, this is grandpa he's spending time with, right? I, I must have said it wrong. Ab, what would Absalom be doing for three years living with the king, his grandpa, in Gesher, who already kind of doesn't have a great relationship with David to begin with? Lion. Mm hmm. Oliver. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's possible that, you know, what we see here is a little bit of the string pulling that sets up the coup that Absalom is going to pull in chapter 15. Uh, we're going to keep reading, and you can decide what to think about that. Well, of course, David, how does David feel about Absalom's departure? Now, this is the, this is the tricky part. Uh, how does David feel about Absalom's departure? Does he want Absalom back or not? I see one person shaking their head yes. I saw somebody else shaking their head no. Yeah. This is a tough one, isn't it? Okay, here's, here's the issue. Um, there's a, strictly speaking, what we've got here is, uh, there, some Bibles add the word heart. The New American Standard Bible, for instance, says that the heart of King David longed to go out to Absalom for he was comforted concerning Amnon since he was dead. And that makes it sound like David likes Absalom. And in verse 1 of the next chapter, Joab the son of Jeruiah perceived that the king's heart was inclined toward Absalom. Now that sounds positive too. But there's another way to translate it. And you know, here's what we get. And the Septuagint follows this approach, but also the Doe Rames Bible. King David ceased to pursue after Absalom because he was comforted concerning the death of Amnon. And Joab, the son of Zeruiah, perceived that the king's heart was against Absalom. Uh, and, you know, either option is grammatically possible. So which one fits a little better with the context? You get into chapter 14. And the bulk of chapter 14 is Joab trying to persuade David to bring Absalom back. And I just got to wonder, why would Joab spend so much effort and energy trying to persuade David to bring Absalom back and then have Absalom spend another couple of years in the city not even seeing the king because the king doesn't seem to want to see him before he's finally brought into the king's presence and restored to royal favor? Does that sound like the king's in heart is against Absalom or towards Absalom? Which one? It sounds like he's a little more against him, doesn't it? Um, and so, I mean, and this is a difficult thing. I, don't, I realize I'm taking the minority view on this passage, uh, with, and certainly the minority view in translation, but uh, it seems to be that the, the spirit of King David ceased to go out against Absalom, and the phrase go out against uh, can simply be idiomatic for military action. Because he was comforted over Amnon, because he was dead, and Joab the son of Zeruiah knew the heart of the king was against Absalom. Alright. That's a, that's a little bit uh, of a different take on that anyway. Okay. Um, let's get into chapter 14. And chapter 14, we're probably not going to be able to get through all of this, but uh, what we've got is a very lengthy in exchange with the wise woman of Tekoa. And uh, why don't we go ahead and just read this. Joab, the son of Zeruiah, perceived that the king's heart was against Absalom. So Joab sent to Tekoa and brought a wise woman from there and said to her, Please, pretend to be a mourner. Put on mourning garments now and do not anoint yourself with oil, but be like a woman who has been mourning for the dead many days. And go to the king and speak to him in this manner. So Joab put the words in her mouth. And when the woman of Tekoa spoke to the king, she fell on her face to the ground and prostrated herself and said, Help, O king! The king said to her, What is your trouble? She answered, Truly I am a widow, for my husband is dead. Your maidservant had two sons. The two of them struggled together in the field, and there was no one to separate them, so one struck the other and killed him. 
Now behold, the whole family has risen against your maidservant, and they say, Hand over the one whom struck his brother, that we may put him to death for the life of his brother whom he killed, and destroy the heir also. Thus they will extinguish my coal which is left, so as to leave my husband neither name nor remnant on the face of the earth. The king said to the woman, Go to your house, and I will give orders concerning you. The woman of Tekoa said to the king, Oh, my lord, the king, the iniquity is on me in my father's house, but the king and his throne are guiltless. So the king said, Well, whoever speaks to you, bring him to me, and he will not touch you anymore. She said, Please, let the king remember the Lord your God, so that the avenger of blood will not continue to destroy. Otherwise, they will destroy my son. And he said, As the Lord lives, not one hair of your son shall fall to the ground. Then the woman said, Please, let your maidservant speak a word to my lord the king. He said, Speak. The woman said, Why then have you planned such a thing against the people of God? For in speaking this word, the king is this one who is guilty, in that the king does not bring back his banished one. For we will surely die and are like water spilled on the ground, which cannot be gathered up again. Yet God does not take away life, but plans ways so that the banished one will not be cast out from him. Now the reason I have come to speak this word to my lord the king is that their people have made me afraid. So your maidservant said, Let me now speak to the king. Perhaps the king will perform the request of his maidservant. For the king will hear and deliver his maidservant from the hand of the man who would destroy both me and my son from the inheritance of God. And then your maidservant said, Please let my, the word of my lord the king be comforting. For as the angel of God, so is my lord the king to discern good and evil. May the Lord your God be with you. All right. Now the first thing here, the woman of Tekoa is called a wise woman. Should we be interpreting that as a good thing or a bad thing? Mm, depends what she says, doesn't it? You know who the last person in the book to be called wise was? It was just in the previous chapter. Jonadab. Although it's not translated wise, it's translated shrewd. It's the same word in Hebrew. Um, but Jonadab is also called a wise man. Well, was Jonadab's wisdom very good? Well, no, it was wisdom without principle, as Mark said earlier. Alright, so, you know, we've already got one... We've kind of already been trained by chapter 13 not to trust someone's description as merely wise. Alright, so... Yeah. I think though that in this case, it's referring to a presentation. Why? Apparently, it was someone that you can figure out problems. Probably was. Well, we'll see about that. Uh, we'll see about that. Alright, the woman of Tacoma. Joab would choose her. She has a reputation. Yeah, she has a reputation for, um, you know. Okay. Well, we got this rather lengthy parable. What's the point of this story? Remind us of anything? Hmm? She tells him this rather lengthy court case. David gives a verdict, and she goes, Oh, by the way, this court case is really about something else. Where have we seen this before? This. Hmm? Nathan did this. Yeah, Nathan did this in chapter 12, too. So she kind of reminds us of Nathan a little bit, does she? But is she exactly like Nathan? That's another thing to consider. Uh, now, well, here's, here's the basically what sets it up. She's a widow. Her husband is dead. She has two sons. And one of them kills the other. And, you know, perhaps you know, Amnon and Absalom are represented here. I don't know. The extended family is saying, we, need, we want, we, you know, the, second, the son that killed needs to be put to death, which is legally what the law would have required. That's the penalty that's demanded there. But of course, the, second, the extended family has an ulterior motive. And their ulterior motive is that if both sons are dead, that means that there's no more descendants and who gets to inherit the property? Well, we do. We get to divvy up the inheritance all to ourselves. So what we have here is we have greed disguised as justice. There's no direct heir to the father. The extended family will acquire the land. The husband is left without descendant. She is left without provider. And... Well, all of her relatives win, and she loses. Now, in this case, the avenger of blood law seems like a subject to a higher government appeal. She takes it to David, and David kind of overrules it. Uh, this is, shows how government has the right of the sword, per Romans 13. David has the right to say yea or nay on this. 
They go back and forth for a little bit. He says, you know, go wait for my verdict, but she doesn't like that. Don't let anyone bother about you about this, and she doesn't like that either. She keeps pleading. She says, let the king remember Yahweh your God, in verse 11, which is an idiomatic way of asking David to swear an oath. Well, she's not satisfied by that answer that David gives. She wants legal protection. She doesn't want the avenger of blood to destroy anymore. He's, and so finally, in ver the end of verse 11, he says, you know, I'm going to protect your son. Not one hair of his shall fall to the ground. Kind of interesting, because uh, the son in question of David has a lot of hair. Uh, and winds up getting his hair all caught in the tree. But that's another part of the story. Um, well, of course, the real, like Nathan, the, story, the tables are turned. The parables are cover for the real situation. And what's the real situation? Well, you are the man, David. You're the one that's trying to kill off the last heir. You know, even though you've only already got 20 other sons involved in this whole thing. Now, here's the thing. I, you know, the more I, at first I read this story, I thought, you know, she's a lot like Nathan. But the more I got thinking about it, more I realized that we actually got the opposite thing going on here. In Nathan's parable, Nathan was trying to get the king to set aside his feelings and do the right thing. This parable is doing exactly the opposite. This parable is trying to get the king to set aside doing the right thing for feelings, for what feels right. And bringing Absalom back causes David a lot more trouble than keeping him away, ultimately. Uh... Now, that, that, that's what we're seeing here. Nathan was sent by God. Did God send this woman? Well, Joab sent the woman, according to the text. Now, well, there's another element here. This is all Joab's idea and not the Lord's idea. Um, now, the king... Uh, well, she makes a comment in verse 14. The Lord... Well, God does not take away life, in verse 14 but plans ways so that the banished will not be cast out from him. Now, is that a true statement? God does not take away life? Hmm? It's not always true. Certainly not, no. Um, it's not true in the temporal sense. Everybody dies at some point. Uh, and in fact, in chapter 17 and verse 14, we learn that God is the one engineering Absalom's death. They bring Absalom back, and then the Lord plans to do away with him and kill him off. So, uh, you have that issue as well. Now, there is a sense in which the woman's statement is more true than anyone realizes, because everybody will ultimately be raised from the dead. There will be a resurrection of the dead. But I doubt she contemplated that particular element here. You know, what she's doing here, she makes an argument for being merciful and forgiving. But is this the wisdom of God, or is this the wisdom of man? Because there is a difference between the two. That, that, that's a distinction we need to appreciate and recognize. Now the king's ruling, the king's ruling is to bring back Absalom. And of course he perceives that Joab is involved in this. The king answered and said to the woman, Please do not hide anything from me that I am about to ask you. The woman said, Let my lord the king please speak. And the king said, Is the hand of Joab with you in all this? The woman replied, As your soul lives, my lord the king, no one can turn to the right or to the left from anything that my lord the king has spoken. Indeed, it was your servant Joab who commanded me, and it was he who put all these words in the mouth of your maidservant in order to change the appearance of things. Your servant Joab has done this thing, but my Lord is wise, like the wisdom of the angel of God, to know all that is in the earth. Now, she's very persuasive. But is she right? Well, history will tell us about that one. We're out of time. We'll pick up uh, verse 21 next time. Anybody have any comments or questions they want to throw in? Not, well, um, well, we'll call it done. We'll pick up in chapter 14 next time.